the Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> The makers of Johnson Wax products for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn and Phil Leslie, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. If you've ever thought, why should I go to the trouble of cleaning and polishing my car, I'd like to suggest that it seems to be a matter both of good business and of personal pride. It's good business to protect the paint job from injury by removing destructive road grime and dirt, thus increasing the trade-in value of your car. And on that subject of personal pride, the impression your car makes on your friends and associates, the impression it makes on yourself, can be very important. So give your car an occasional beauty treatment with Johnson's Car New. The popular auto polish that both cleans and polishes with one application. Carnu is so easy to use, you'll gladly do the job yourself. It's a liquid that dries on application to a white powder. Wipe off this powder, and there's that beautiful finish you'd almost forgotten. Carnu is unchanged. Your dealer has it. Ask for Johnson's Carnu, spelled C A R N U. Anytime you pass 79 Wistful Vista and hear the windows rattling slightly and a low, nasty murmur coming out under the door, you'll know the squire has received his monthly bank statement. And here he is, rapidly losing his equilibrium while trying to find his balance, while his wife does her best to drown him out. As we meet, Fibber McGee and Molly. Dirty, double-crossing, pocket-picking book jugglers. You know what that Fourth National Bank done to me this month, Molly? I can't imagine, dearie. They figured my balance exactly the same as I figured it. Now I don't know where I am. <laughs> I got nothing to go on. I have a notion to... Uh, hey! Hey, can't you do that a little quieter, Molly? I'm sorry, dearie. I'm trying very hard to concentrate on this statement, and that noise is very distracting. Very. Well, if your figures agree with the banks, what is there to concentrate on? Aha, uh -huh, that's just the point. Anytime they agree with me, they gotta be wrong. <laughs> they know darn well that I... Hey, what are you doing with my wood-burning outfit? <laughs> is that what this is? Why, certainly that's what this is. Don't you remember that spool rack I made for you with all the design I burned onto it with that? You said that was the prettiest spool rack with that particular design onto it you ever saw. Oh, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as I was cleaning out the hall closet, I merely thought I'd put things away. Now, I'll be very careful with stuff like my wood-burning outfit. One of these days, that fat will come back and... You're what? I'm cleaning out the hall closet. Ooh. Mrs. Carstairs is coming for tea this afternoon. I don't want her to wind up under an avalanche of moose heads, mandolins, and fish poles. <laughs> hey, now, wait a minute, kiddo. If anybody's going to clean out that closet, it'll be me. I got a lot of valuable stuff in there. <laughs> By the way, what'd you do with my stamp collection? Heavenly days, did you have a stamp collection in there? Did I have a stamp collection in there, she said. She said that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you see a little celluloid envelope with a three-cent stamp in it that the cancellation was upside down onto it? You had a collection of one three-cent stamp? Uh-huh. It was the nucleum of a collection. <laughs> the guy's got to start someplace. You better let me clean out that closet, Molly. Well, frankly, I don't think Carstairs coming to tea is a very good reason for it. Do you want her to think you married a bad housekeeper? What that old gooseberry thinks is frantically unimportant to me, Mommy. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't want her to think now that... Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. McGee. Hello, Alice. Hi, kid. Now, don't get in the way here now. Huh? Creepers, are you cleaning out that closet? May I watch? Sure, but don't touch things, Alice. I got a lot of personal valuables in there. I don't want them all around. Like this stuff here. Mm. McGee, if that's what's been making this closet smell like a cider mill, throw it out. What? Throw out my old chemistry set? Well, 
I went clear through high school with this stuff. Gee, did you really, Mr. Yeah. McGee? Yes, and I remember the day he did it, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> He went clear through the high school and through the roof of a laundry a block away. <laughs> you know his eyebrows haven't grown quite back yet. <laughs> Look at him, Alice. I wish <laughs> I could remember the formula I was working on that day. <laughs> Seems to me I was on the track of a new kind of high-powered gasoline. <laughs> I was going to call it Ethel in honor of my chemistry teacher, Ethel Fadich. <laughs> They've been making ethyl gasoline for years and years, Mr. McGee. What? They have? Sure. Well, by George, if I had the dough, I'd fight for my rights all through the juvenile court. <laughs> juvenile court? Well, sure, I was just a kid when I invented it. Oh, I think chemistry is wonderful, Mr. McGee. My cousin is a chemist, and he's just patented a new kind of glue that simply won't stick to anything. <laughs> Why, Alice, what good is a glue that won't stick? Well, he says it will teach people not to break things in the first place. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's simple stuff like that that makes fortunes for some people. I stumbled onto a freezing compound one day that kept a bottle of water cold for two days. What'd you call it, dearie? Ice. <laughs> Creepers. I've been using it for years, and I never knew who thought it up. Yeah, and you know he never got a nickel from Sonia Henny for it either? <laughs> well, I got an idea I'm going to work on one of these days that'll put us all on Easy Street. And I'm not going to breathe it to a soul, except a few close friends. Uh, what is it, Mr. McGee? Well, I... Shut the door, Molly. Okay. Thanks. After what happened with that ethyl gasoline deal, I'm kind of suspicious. <laughs> you know what they feed silkworms on to make them make silk? <laughs> Certainly. Mulberry leaves. Ever think what might happen if you fed them on leaves from a rubber plant? Sheepers, girdles. Exactly. <laughs> now, not a word of this to anybody, see? The nylon people would shoot me down like a dog if it ever got out. <laughs> but that's for the future. Right now, i got to straighten out this closet. One side. Billy Mail to the orchestra, and the more I see you... closet cleaned out, dearie. The house looked very nice. You know, it's a lot of wasted effort just to make an impression on old Mrs. Carstairs. Well, that old man trap is so nearsighted that last week in the grocery she paid two bits for her left hand thinking it was a bunch of bananas. <laughs> oh, you're exaggerating. Yeah, I was exaggerating. She only paid 23 cents. <laughs> you know, you'd like Mrs. Carstairs if you'd stop antagonizing her. Me? Stop antagonizing her? You got the slip cover on the wrong love seat, Snooky. <laughs> she antagonizes me. Why, she looks at me like I was something unpleasant she just found in her club sandwich. Well, my goodness, I don't think she's so. Come in. Oh, it's Dr. Gamble. Yeah, I recognize him. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Molly. Hello there, Rumpelstiltskin. Rumpel what skin? Rumpelstiltskin. 
a legendary character, like you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Excuse the looks of the place, Doctor. McGee is cleaning out the hall closet. Voluntarily, or did you get a court order? As the trout says, when he snapped at the fly, I'm doing this on my own hook. <laughs> and don't get in my way, Batso. I'm busy. Well, interesting evidence of a misspent life you have there, Chubby. Where'd you get the school bells? Christmas present from Mr. Chips? Those are Swiss bells, Doctor. He used those when he was in vaudeville. Play something for the doctor, dearie. Uh, he wouldn't appreciate it, or I would. That guy's got less music in him than a wet drum. As usual, beanbag, you are speaking from the depths of your abysmal ignorance. I was seriously considering an operatic career at one time. My goodness, were you really, Doctor? Mm -hmm. Tenor or baritone? You sang second base with the Brooklyn Dodgers, didn't you, Doc? <laughs> I refuse to be drawn into a musical controversy with you, you illiterate little pack rat. You're the kind who'd sit through a movie three times to hear the Who's Your Hot Shots play the Hawaiian war chant on a washboard and auto horn. <laughs> You're darn well right, I would, big boy. That's real music. <laughs> See what I mean, Molly? Every time he mentions a sextet from Lucia, he asks if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> Remind me to sing for you sometime, my dear. Oh, that I will, Doctor. I will indeed. Sing her something from Ada, Doc. She loves Ada. From what? Ada. That's the opera, Ada. Are you by any chance referring to the opera Aida by Verdi? Oh, yes. First presented in Cairo, Egypt, December 24th, 1871. Hmm. I think that's what he means, Doctor. I think so, too. And if you'll excuse me, I'll get out of here before I lose what little respect I have for the little music lover. No, I was just kidding, Doc. I know my music. I didn't study the mandolin 25 years for nothing, you know. <laughs> that's one man's opinion. Well, he really knows more music than you think, Doctor. If he knows any music, it's more than I think. <laughs> Let me ask you one question, Rigoletto. Shoot, Siegfried. <laughs> What is counterpoint? Why, that's when a kid in a candy store asks how many of these do you get for a penny. <laughs> that's all, brother. So long, Molly. Oh, for goodness sakes, McGee, I don't know why you have to tease people like that. Why do you pretend to be so dumb? Oh, I like to be underestimated. <laughs> then when I do something unintelligent, I get twice the credit. <laughs> well, I better get busy. McGee, I wish you'd get rid of that old moose head. Oh, I will after she has her tea. <laughs> Wouldn't be polite to give her the bum's rush the minute she gets here, you know. I oh, can't... I was not referring to Mrs. Carstairs. I meant that one in the closet there. Oh, that. Well, I still think that it looks swell over the fireplace. I think it would look better in the fireplace. It's such a... Oh, my goodness, I almost forgot. We're practically out of sugar. I wonder if Mr. Sale would send some over right away. I'll call and ask him. He owes me a favor. For what? I called his attention to a misspelled word in one of his ads last week. He had an L in salmon. Oh. <laughs> well, call him anyway, dearie. Hand me the phone. Here. Thanks. Hello, operator. Give me Jimmy Sale's grow. Is that you, Mert? Oh, dear. How's every little thing, Mert? Is he? What's that, Mert? Your brother? Judge gave him 20 years, eh? Gee, that's great, Mert. Good heavens, McGee. What's great about that? Mert's brother helped old Judge Jeffrey husk some green corn. Did such a good job, the judge gave him 20 years. Oh. <laughs> What's that, Mert? Yeah. Okay, I'll call later. <laughs> well, maybe we can squeeze by with what sugar we have, dearie. Carstairs shouldn't ought to use sugar anyway. She shows every lump she's ever eaten. <laughs> Particularly around... Hello, folks. I was just going by, and I thought... Oh, oh gone it. Oh. watch your step there, will you, Junior? Now look what you did. Oh, I'm sorry, pal. Very clumsy of me. What did I step on? Just an old cigar box, Mr. Wilcox. Think nothing of it. What do you mean, just an old cigar box? You know what I was saving that for? No, what were you saving it for? Well, I was... Oh, well, I don't remember right now, but... <laughs> I'll bet I had a definite use for it. <laughs> Uh, excuse me for pointing, but just what are you doing, pal? Playing store? No, he's cleaning out this closet, Mr. Wilcox. Mrs. Carstairs is coming for tea, and we want things to look real nice. Yeah, she's the kind of old Snoopy puss that'll be poking her snozzle into all the closets, Junior. You know the type. Talking about the weather with one hand and counting the pillowcases with the other. <laughs> oh, look, you've got her wrong, pal. Mrs. Carstairs is a very nice person. That's what I keep telling you, Mr. Wilcox, but they just don't seem to get along together. Ah, pata. 
She's just a wilted puddle off the Mayflower. <laughs> Why, she's one of the worst old... Hey, what are you doing, Junior? Just looking in this closet, pal. I never saw it empty before. I want to satisfy my curiosity. Curiosity about what, Mr. Wilcox? Four in that closet. Gee, it's wonderful. In spite of all that junk piled in there, year after year, the floor is in wonderful condition. <laughs> what did you protect it with? Black sea. <laughs> If I wasn't a truthful guy with whom loyalty to a sponsor was a prime consideration, <laughs> I could break your little heart. <laughs> ah, but we have to tell the truth, Mr. Wilcox. Johnson's wax it is. I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> Gee, I'd like to have a photograph of that closet floor. You throw moose heads in there, you toss in horseshoes and ice skates... You bang it with golf clubs and wet snow shovels. You heave in a lot of fishing tackle, shotguns, and mandolins, and look at it. Hardly a scratch. What a perfect example of how Johnson's wax protects and preserves a wood surface. Look at his eyes flash, Molly. <laughs> I'll bet Balboa looked just like that when he discovered the Panama Canal. <laughs> ah, what a beautiful, beautiful floor. What luster. What a tactile delight to rub one's digits over such a luminescent patina. Ah, sure. <clears throat> what on earth is the man talking about? Is the guest room made up? Maybe he better lie down a little while. You feel okay, Junior? Oh, I feel marvelous, pal. Magnificent. What a day in my life to have everything I've ever said about Johnson's wax so completely justified, so marvelously exemplified. Its qualities of beautification, preservation, protection. Oh, I've got to write to Racine about this. See you later, folks. <laughs> Scene. There goes the greatest ham actor since the Three Little Pigs. I thought he sounded very sincere, me. Oh, he meant it all right. It was one. It was those gestures that pulled my cork. Those rolling eyes, clenched hand on the forehead, <laughs> like William S. Hart bidding farewell to his favorite horse. Well, never mind him, McGee. Mrs. Carstairs will be here very shortly. Better get this stuff put away. Okay, I'll have it out of the way in two jerks. Now let me see. Oh, gee, look what I found. My old camp stove. I'd like to have five bucks for every pound of bacon I've ruined on that thing. <laughs> Speaking of stoves, dearie, I better see how Beulah's coming with the refreshments. Mm. Oh, Beulah! Beulah! Somebody ball for Beulah? <laughs> Yeah, Mrs. McGee was just wondering if you were all set for the tea clutch, Beulah. Yes, yeah, sir. Everything is 6'2 and even, sir. <laughs> Best china laid out, cake all frosted, silverware polish, and a napkin start like Mr. Hoover's collar. <laughs> well, we want to kind of spread it on for Mrs. Carstairs, Beulah. Send the lady fingers out for a manicure if necessary. And see that the seams are all straight on the tea bags. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just leave everything to Beulah, folks. Everything's going to be done with finesse, eclair, and savoir faire. <laughs> Genesee Pop? Genesee what? Genesee Pop, ma'am. That's a French expression meaning, you think I'm kidding? <laughs> you speak French, Bueller? Well, just enough to get by with folks who don't speak it at all, sir. <laughs> I, I tried to learn it once by photograph records, but there was a bad rattle in the speaker. So I never know if my accent is wrong vocally or mechanically. <laughs> Mr. McGee tried to learn Spanish that way once, Beulah. Did you have any luck with it, sir? Nope. I took five lessons, then tried to order dinner in a Spanish restaurant. The hat check girl slapped me, the waiter gave me an apron, and the cashier handed over all her dough and called the cops. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm strictly a Latin from Peoria. <laughs> <laughs> Get his face laughing away to him. <laughs> a Latin from Peoria? <laughs> Man. The King's Man and the Fireman Fire. Fireman Gold, a king who married in June, wants to be free. He bought a handsome love nest, but his hard lines found. Likes a firehouse, she wears a crimson skirt, a fireman's hat, a red flannel shirt. Bang goes the bell, and she's off, boys, in a cloud of confusion and dirt. Fireman's bride 
Ride the fireman's bride Won't stay home by her fireside Of all accounts She'd rather bounce In a fireman's mess She leaps to the engine And clings to the hose How she hangs on Nobody knows Out comes the net And then over she goes High up they throw her While she hollers The fireman's bride People can find Has the fireman goggle eyes High as a kite Ain't she a sight? Not the fireman's bride. Oh, the fireman's bride, the fireman's bride. Won't stay home by her fireside. From all accounts, she'd rather bounce in a fireman's nest. She leaps to the engine and clings to the hose. How she hangs on, nobody knows. Out comes the net and then over she goes. High up they throw her while she hollers. Lord. The fireman rides, people can find. And the fireman goggle eyes. High as a kite, ain't they a sight? Running around all over town with the fireman McGee, I just looked into the hall closet, and I want to congratulate you. I think it looks wonderful. No, it's nothing that any red-blooded American boy couldn't have done. His wife kept hollering at him about it. (laughs) Hey, how does this shirt look? Very nice when you put a tie on. A tie? This is a sport shirt. Didn't you see that picture of Jack Carson in last night's paper? He was wearing a shirt exactly like this one. Jack Carson is a comedian. Hmm? You're more the Herbert Marshall type. (laughs) My George, I think I am at that. You are? Does Herbert Marshall wear a bow or a foreign hand? Because I want to... Oh, I'll bet that's her. Too late for necktie. If you can casually drop Jack Carson into the conversation, I'll explain about the sports shirt. Just forget it, dearie. Let her take you as you are. Okay. Come in. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Carstairs? Do come in. How do you do, my dear? So nice of you to have me for tea. Hi, Carsty. Wiggle out of the mink and toss the weary frame on an orange crate. <laughs> uh... Good day, Mr. McGee. Am I to construe that bit of jargon as an invitation to be seated? You ain't whistling Dixie, babe. (laughs) Try this chair over here. You can sink down in that like a sow in a swamp. Oh! (laughs) I like a... Uh, here, uh, uh, let me take your coat, Mrs. Carstairs. I'll hang it right here in the hall closet. Now, hey, look out. Don't open that. that that's so... Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> that's okay. My, my gosh, I'm not used to this yet. <laughs> Go ahead, open it. <laughs> yeah, he's joking, Mrs. Carstairs. Yeah. <laughs> he's always kidding me about this hall closet being too full of everything. <sighs> <laughs> I'm sure it looks very neat, my dear. You are evidently an excellent housekeeper. Oh, I sometimes think I'm almost too fussy. I sometimes think so, too, myself. Oh, well, it was so nice of you to come over, Mrs. Carstairs. I have been looking forward to it, my dear. I think afternoon tea is such a pleasant custom. The English do those things so well, you know. Yeah, but I bet it gets monotonous day after day, Carsty. Three or four weeks of it, and I'd run out of small talk. (laughs) Oh, I rather doubt that, Mr. McGee. The longer I know you, the smaller your talk seems to get. Uh, you're not saying that just because you admire me, are you, Carsty? <laughs> I rather doubt that my statement was motivated by any such consideration, Mr. McGee. Well, you're not a bad kid yourself. Have a cigarette? Thank you. I don't smoke. Neither do I, Mrs. Carsty. Well, that needn't stop you kids from picking up a few packages for the old man now, then. <laughs> Are you quite sure we're not keeping you from some important masculine affairs, Mr. McGee? No, no, I got nothing particular to do, Carsty. This is such a charming little living room of yours, Mrs. McGee. And may I say that that is an extremely handsome piano you have. Well, thank you. I think very highly of that piano. Yeah, I gave her that piano for Christmas eight years ago, Carsty. I just happened to be walking through the Bontown department store one day, see? Thinking about nothing in particular. Naturally. <laughs> and I seen this piano, and I says to myself, there's the piano. Excuse me a minute, Mrs. Carstairs. Come in. <sighs> Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hi, Mr. McGee. Hi, Jimmy, my boy. Here's your check. It's all made out. Two bucks, 40 cents. Oh, thanks a lot. Here's the receipt. How are the wife and family, Jimmy? Just swell, thanks. My little girl was eight years old yesterday. Gee whiz. The time sure flies, don't it, kid? Yeah. You know... She was born just a few months after you bought that piano. Yes, yes, she must have been if she's eight years old now. (laughs) You're going to have that thing paid for before you know it. (laughs) 
Well, thanks a lot, folks. See you next week. (laughs) (laughs) Now then, uh, what were we talking about, Mrs. Carstairs? You were saying that Mr. McGee gave you this piano as a Christmas gift eight years ago. Yeah. It was so thoughtful of him to make it a weekly remembrance. (laughs) Uh, My dear, I would like to see the rest of your house. Why, sure, Carsty. Come right along. It may not be a palace, but it's home. Yes, do come and see it, Mrs. Carstairs. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is the dining room in here. Yeah, you can tell that by the table. <laughs> this table seats 12 people when we put the extra leaves in, Carsey. The only thing is we haven't got any extra leaves. <laughs> I used them to make some shelves in the garage. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, personally, I think large parties are such a bore. Oh, you're just self-conscious, Carsey. And uh, right through here is the kitchen, Mrs. Carstairs. Mm-hmm. Something you want, ma'am? Nah, no, thanks, Beulah. Just giving Carsty the 40-cent tour. Good afternoon, Beulah. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Carstairs. You can take the tea things in any time, Beulah. Coming right up, ma'am. What a cozy little kitchen, Mrs. McGee. So convenient. No, it's a pip for a small family like us, Carsty. You can build yourself a five-decker salami sandwich and open a bottle of beer in here without walking five acres. <laughs> really? And that, I suppose, is the service porch through that door, Mrs. McGee. This door? No, this is just the back stairs, Mrs. Carstairs. You see... Hey, don't we... open that. That's where I put all the... Ah, 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 ah. Why is it that some homes seem to have so much more charm than others? Is it because of more expensive furnishings? Well, not as a rule. It's a matter of good taste and good housekeeping, in which richly polished floors and other surfaces play a very important part. Floors that are regularly waxed with Johnson's Wax become more and more beautiful. They set off your furnishings to best advantage. There are many other uses for Johnson's Wax in a well-groomed home. Picture frames, ornaments, window sills, even the fireplace and the andirons. And, of course, you know that the tough film of wax protects all of these surfaces from wear, dirt, and moisture. Also, that it saves you hours of housekeeping work because waxed surfaces are so easy to keep clean. Careful housekeepers call this protective housekeeping with genuine Johnson's Wax, which comes in three forms, paste, liquid, and the new cream wax especially developed for use on furniture and woodwork. How long did Carstairs stay after I left, Molly? Oh, about three cups and six crumpets. (laughs) But uh, what made you leave in such a hurry? Look, Mommy... When a woman like Karsty takes my own mandolin back in the living room and starts playing tea for two on it, I can take a hint. <laughs> I don't have to be hit with a brick bat. No, although I'll admit the idea crossed my mind. Huh? Oh, <clears throat> good night. <laughs> good night, all. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax 25th for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company.